Good morning, everybody. Vladimir Putin may have said he's moving Russian troops into two breakaway regions of Ukraine to perform peacekeeping roles. But as far as the West is concerned, it's a sign of an imminent invasion. Within the last few hours, military vehicles, including tanks, have been seen on the outskirts of Donetsk, the capital of one of the breakaway regions of eastern Ukraine. In an address on state TV in Moscow last night, President Putin announced that he was recognising the breakaway regions as independent states. Our security and defence editor, Deborah Haynes, joining us now live from the Ukrainian capital of Kiev. Um, hello to you, uh, Deborah. Good morning. Um, is this be how is this being viewed in Ukraine today? With fear and concern, events yesterday unfolded so quickly, you'll remember it started with hopes of, of diplomacy led by France's president and ended, like you said, with tanks rolling into separatist-held parts of Ukraine after the Russian president, having convened a National Security Council, which was broadcast on television, this incredible theatre, deciding that he was going to recognise these two breakaway regions that have been under the control of Russia-backed separatists for the past eight years, effectively shredding eight years of diplomatic efforts to try to resolve this crisis through negotiation, turning his back on what's known as the Minsk Accords and putting his troops into that territory, saying that they're there as peacekeepers and building on this false narrative that has been generated over the past few days in particular that the Ukrainian government poses a threat to civilians living in that area. That's simply not true, say the Ukrainian government. But despite that, we saw those images, didn't we, of civilians being evacuated out of the separatist-held parts of Luhansk and Donetsk over the last few days. And now these Russian forces, supposedly peacekeepers, moving in. All of this watched on in horror by the rest of the country and the big concern being that should Russia accuse Ukraine of launching shells against its troops in that area, even if that's not true, then that could be the trigger for a wide-scale invasion. OK, thank you. Thanks very much. I know you're going to update us throughout the course of the morning. Thank you. As you can see, um, the Health Secretary is with us. Lots to talk to you about this morning. Let's start. Good morning. I wonder if we could start with Ukraine. Um, is this a de facto invasion? Look, we're waking up to a very dark day in Europe and uh, it's clear from what we've already seen and, and, and found out today that the Russians, President Putin, has the, decided uh, to uh, to um, attack the sovereignty of uh, Ukraine and its territorial integrity. We've always said that's completely unacceptable. We've seen that he has recognised these uh, breakaway eastern regions in Ukraine and from the reports, or I think we can already tell that he's sent in tanks and troops. And so I think it, it's it, from that you can conclude that the invasion of Ukraine has begun. What are we going to do about it? There's a Cobra meeting taking place uh, right now, chaired by the Prime Minister. And, uh, of course, that will be discussing what action we will take. We have been very clear right from the start of this crisis that we wouldn't hesitate to take action. I understand that the Prime Minister... I uh, spoke to President Zelensky of Ukraine uh, last night, assured him of our support, but also that we will be introducing sanctions, as we said we always will. What sort of military support can we offer? We've already been providing military support uh, to Ukraine now for a number of months, and, and certainly that's picked up in the last few weeks. Uh, I'm sure that will be part of the discussion uh, at the COBRA meeting, and uh, we will continue to provide uh, such support, uh, but also look at how we can uh, take action against Russia uh, through sanctions. And, and there are measures that, that can be taken because of legislation that we had introduced uh, last year that will help in, in responding and responding uh, very quickly. And I'm sure that we make those sanctions uh, targeted as possible to the people that are responsible for this fragrant violation of international law. I got the impression that there were sort of two tiers of economic sanctions. Why don't, are, are, we, are we still going to do that? And, or are we just going to hit him hard? Well, uh, I think I'd want to wait for the outcome of the COBRA meeting. I think that is that is appropriate. And I know that after that meeting is concluded, the Prime Minister will make a statement to Parliament and set out what we know about the current situation on the ground, but also what action we will take. The weaponry at the moment is defensive. Are we going to send offensive weaponry? 
again, I think that these will be exactly the things that are rightly discussed in the COBRA meeting, where the ministers at that meeting will be presented with all the latest information, intelligence, including uh, from our allies uh, across NATO. And once that uh, meeting has concluded, I think it is right that the Prime Minister sets out the action to Parliament first. Just an another question on that, and then we'll move on to COVID, if I may. What should Brits do that are in these two breakaway regions at the moment? Well, we've already advised uh, British citizens uh, to, to leave Ukraine, and, uh, and I hope that all British citizens have been following that advice. Of course, not everyone uh, does. And my understanding is that there are still commercial flights available. People are still able uh, to leave Ukraine, and uh, we would continue to advise those uh, individuals, British citizens to leave Ukraine. So get out if you can. Yes. Um, and just a, a final thought on, on that, if I may. There, there was a statement uh, overnight from the White House talking about basically a communique between the um, United States and France and Germany and a couple of times referring to those three nations. Why are we not included in that? Well, I haven't seen the particular communique that you refer to, mm -hmm. but you can see, I think, everyone. It's been evident over the last few weeks how important a role the UK has played uh, in, in this crisis, working with our allies across NATO uh, in the conversations the Prime Minister himself has been having with uh, the presidents and, and leaders of uh, different uh, countries within NATO, and also uh, what the Prime Minister had to say himself at the recent Munich conference. Something that uh, will very much be troubling my viewers this morning, and I know you'll want to clear up all restrictions dropped as far as COVID is concerned from Thursday. How are we going to future-proof against variants? Look, so yesterday was, was a historic day. We were already the freest country in Europe, and yesterday we were able to go further thanks to the protections we've built, but also the efforts of the British people. And I think it's worth remembering that the, the restrictions that we had introduced, of course, they had an important purpose, but they were never intended uh, to become a way of life. You know, they, they also came at a huge cost to our freedoms, education, mental health and, and other significant costs. So you know, being able to remove them in the way that we did yesterday was a significant you know, was a new step forward. Uh, but of course, we do need to remain vigilant. So that means we keep a, a hold of our primary defences, especially uh, vaccines. If we look at the last few months, I think the one thing, if we had to make just one thing that made the biggest difference of all was our uh, booster programme. We were the first country in Europe to, to be able to boost 50% of our adult population. Now it's over 70%. And that's also, by the way, one of the reasons I accepted the advice of the JCVI yesterday to offer a second booster in the spring uh, to those aged over 75 elderly people in care homes and, and the And then another one in, in, in September for over 50s, is that right? Well, there, there may be. I mean, what the JCVI said yesterday, that is their current view, but of course they will keep that under review. Uh, but there may well be, I think it's likely there will be one in the winter, but we, it's, uh, we can't say at this point for what age group that will be. And again, we will listen to the JCVI at that time. But certainly for the spring, there will be one for the group of people that the JCVI set out. In terms of your particular question, yeah. though, about um, future yeah. uh, variants... Yeah, future-proofing, yeah. Yeah, uh, and, that's, and, and that is, it is right. We have to uh, understand that clearly you know, COVID is still out there. We may be done with COVID, but it's certainly not done with us. And uh, we have to remain cautious and vigilant. And that is why we set out yesterday also just how we will continue to do that. So vaccines remain an important part of our defences. The antivirals and other treatments that we have also uh, will play a continued important role. But also we have put in place a surveillance system you know, that we're able to detect any potential future threats and also the ability for us to react quickly should that happen. Great way to do that would be to keep lateral flow tests. You're not going to do that. Um, we understand that it's going to cost something like £2 billion uh, a month. Seems like an awful lot of money. Um, should we have free COVID tests, lateral flow tests for some groups? Uh, we will be keeping free lateral flow tests for some groups, the, for Which the most ones? vulnerable. So, uh, you, so, for example, I mentioned a moment ago we have uh, antivirals. So these are fantastic new drugs specifically designed for COVID. They played a huge role over Omicron and they will continue to play an important role. So uh, for people that are eligible for those drugs, we've targeted those at the what we call the clinically extremely vulnerable, as defined by the NHS. It's about, it's about 1.3 million uh, yeah. people. And for them, uh, whether it's PCRs or any other testing that we require to, to make sure that we know when uh, we need to offer those drugs to protect them, though, so we have testing in place, we will have lateral flow tests uh, for uh, staff in, in, um, for the time being. We will keep it to, uh, for staff in uh, care homes. And Until we, when? 
We will, we will keep it under review. So that is the, the decision we announced yesterday for certain vulnerable settings, essentially you know, care homes and hospitals, uh, to lateral flow tests and PCR tests in some cases will continue to be used. But to all, all intents and purposes, people won't know if they've got COVID or not, will they, from the 1st of April? Um, they, won't. They, they won't. Without a test, of course, you won't know. And, but that, this so is you part... could go to work with COVID? Well, you you could go to work with flu, and when we and the reason I say that is that one of the things that the prime minister rightly said yesterday is we've got to learn to live with COVID as we have learned to live with other respiratory diseases. You know, if someone thinks that they might have flu, they don't need to take a test. You know, you just you recognise the symptoms, and ideally you would you know, stay away from work. You don't want to infect your colleagues or friends. And, and that is how we have lived with viruses. And now with, with COVID, obviously, we couldn't have done anything like that at the start of COVID for, uh, and, and throughout most of the pandemic because we didn't have the tools that we have today. But the situation today is very different. Yeah, but the, the Prime Minister did say that we need to have the German attitude to calling in sick, which basically is if you're unwell, you should call in sick. The Germans, um, uh, they apparently the sick pay is 50% pay for 84 weeks. Ours is £96.35. pence. You can see why people go to work, even when well, they're feeling unwell. We have a statutory... Should we look at that again? Look, we, you're referring to our statutory sick pay levels, you know, fairly. Uh, most businesses, you know, most employers pay a lot more than that. I mean, that is a, a minimum. Some but don't, most, though, well, the, 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 You're right. That's why I said I, I recognise that. And that's why I said most. I didn't say yeah, all. Yeah, but it does and put, put it, workers in a very difficult position. It's, it, it, it is important to keep you know, levels of statutory sick pay and other you know, benefits uh, to keep that uh, under review. And that is done at all times. But it is also right that we start moving back to normal and 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 i think this is a, a moment you know what the government announced yesterday it's a moment that we can all be proud of because we've all you know we've played a collective effort uh, to to reach this point but there are and downsides say, to it that's my point so if you are at work and you and a colleague tests positive or you fear that they have got covid is it reasonable for you to tell your boss that you're going to go home is it i think if you yes i think if you if you feel that you've got covid uh, just as if you feel you've got flu or some other a virus that you shouldn't really be at work. Of course, it's reasonable to, to say to your boss that it might not be sensible for you to What are you saying to those employees who think that that's a bad idea, who wouldn't support that? You're saying actually you need to bear in mind how your workers might feel. Yes, what we what we will be setting out is is, is guidance, your know, public health guidance. So for now, whilst we're removing the legal requirement to self isolate from Thursday, uh, that there will be guidance that would advise you to continue to do so until the end of March. And from the 1st of April, we will set out new guidance that will be much more general, but still sensible guidance about how you might behave if you believe that you have some kind of respiratory or other disease. OK, two acronym questions before I let you go. Uh, these passenger locator forms, bane of travellers' lives, given um, that you don't have to self-isolate from uh, Thursday if you do have COVID, are we going to get rid of them? Um, well, I wouldn't go quite as far right now to say we'll get rid of them right away, uh, but I do think now with the measures that we've announced yesterday, uh, there is a, is a case to review them, and that review is being done right now with the Transport Secretary and the Home Office, and I'm sure some progress will be made. And um, fixed penalty notices. Um, are you with the James Cleverley School of Thinking, which is doesn't matter if the Prime Minister has broken the law or not, he should continue on? Look, I'm not going to get into this. We've, we've discussed this so many times, Kay, and I yeah, think... Yeah, but you never answer the question. No, and the, and, the, and the reason is that there are authorities, official authorities, that are looking into, into this whole issue, rightly so, and, and the Prime Minister himself has come to Parliament and apologised and set out what's happening, but also he's rightly not getting involved in uh, what the authorities the law, are doing. Let's, let, we should we'll let the authorities do their work. I don't think it's appropriate to, to get into if this. If he's misled Parliament, should he resign? Well, it's uh, as, as I said before. These are you know, when you ask me questions with if and if this that these are hypothetical well, questions. I know you did. defined hypothetical for me before. And think, yes, I did. But that, that doesn't change it. I'm that's glad what that stayed is. with you. So I'm, <laughs> I've taken that away. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm not going to uh, get into this. This is uh, the, you. I'm, I'm focused on what's actually with regard to this. The, the prime minister has come to parliament. Authorities investigating this, but I'm focused on my day-to-day -day job. Good to talk to you as always. Thank you very Thank much you. indeed for joining us. Thank you. And the Ukraine crisis is dominating the front pages, as you can imagine, uh, this morning. Let's start with The Guardian. Russia on a collision course with West over Ukraine, writes The Guardian, as the UK is set to respond with tough sanctions. 
The FT reports President Vladimir Putin is poised to recognise eastern Ukraine's two breakaway regions by redrawing borders. And the Daily Telegraph has President Putin warning of bloodshed and reports Russian forces are being sent into Ukraine to keep the peace in breakaway areas. Still to come on the programme for you, discussing the lifting of COVID restrictions in England with Professor Paul Moss from the Institute of Immunology and Immunotherapy at the University of Birmingham. Discussing the crisis in Ukraine with the Defence Select Committee Chair and former Defence Minister Tobias Elwood. And we'll get Labour's take on the Ukraine crisis with the Shadow Defence Secretary John Healy. The UK's ambassador to the UN has urged Russia to step back from invading Ukraine after Vladimir Putin ordered the deployment of troops to two breakaway regions in eastern Ukraine. Here's Boris Johnson chairing uh, a COBRA meeting to discuss new sanctions on Russia. Uh, here's our US correspondent, Martha Kellner. <laughs> Late night in New York and a group of diplomats making a last-ditch effort to avert a disaster unfolding 5,000 miles away. Mr President, it's with great concern and sadness that I brief the Council this evening. This emergency meeting was convened after Russian President Vladimir Putin ordered his troops into two separatist pro-Moscow regions in eastern Ukraine. He calls them peacekeepers. This is nonsense. We know what they really are. In doing so, he has put before the world a choice. We must meet the moment and we must not look away. And a plea from the British representative. Russia has brought us to the brink. We urge Russia to step back. The US say they're now convinced that Vladimir Putin is intent on war, that these troops are being primed for conflict. But Russia's representative at the UN, again denying his country, is the aggressor. I would like to call upon our Western colleagues to think twice, to set emotions to one side and not to make the situation worse. No one other than you can hold back the militaristic plans of Kiev and force it to stop the shelling and provocations against the Lugansk and Donetsk People's Republics. These Ukrainian soldiers are staring down the barrel of a conflict which would devastate their country, as their president called for calm. We don't owe anything to anyone. We won't give away anything to anyone. We are confident in this. President Biden told President Zelensky he remained committed to Ukraine's sovereignty, signing an order prohibiting US investment in the two regions of Ukraine which Russia is now recognising as independent states. The US says more sanctions will be announced today, but as columns of military vehicles roll towards Donetsk, the fear is the time for deterrence and diplomacy may now be running out. Martha Kellner, Sky News, Washington. Tamara is in Downing Street for us. Um, hello to you, Tamara. Uh, stark words there from the health secretary saying he concludes that the invasion of Ukraine has begun. Yes, absolutely. The British government is calling this an invasion. The Russian troops uh, moving into those areas of eastern Ukraine uh, last night. And that means once Boris Johnson has had this COBRA meeting, which will discuss what the actual situation is uh, in eastern Ukraine, uh, what the British government is going to do about it, we expect um, an immediate action, which will be sanctions. Boris Johnson had already talked about the moment a Russian tow cap crosses that border, there would be sanctions. And we expect them to be set out to Parliament this afternoon and debated and uh, agreed on uh, then. They will be uh, very much broader than they have been previously against Russian individuals and companies not just involved in Ukraine but in a range of different economic sectors. And there's also the prospect of working with the US and EU to bring in even tougher sanctions if this escalates. Boris Johnson also spoke to the Ukrainian president last night, Vladimir Zelensky, and said to him that uh, the UK expects a full-scale inv in invasion. Clearly, we're at that stage now. Uh, and that in that case, um, the prospect is that more defensive weaponry will be sent to him uh, in Ukraine. So we may get an update on that from this COBRA meeting shortly. OK, thank you. Uh, let's head to Brussels as well, should we? Laura Bondock is standing by for us now. A British government concludes the invasion of Ukraine has begun. What's the view where you are this morning? Good morning. 
Hi, Kay. Well, yesterday, of course, here in Europe, it was all about summits. Now the talk is all about sanctions. We've had a joint statement from the presidents of the European Commission, the European Council. They said they condemn in the strongest possible terms the Russian president's uh, decision. They said it's a blatant violation of international law as well as the Minsk agreements. And the, they said that the union will react with sanctions against those involved in this illegal act. The European Council president also tweeted this morning he had spoken to the Ukrainian president to express the EU solidarity with him at this time. The question now is what happens next? There was a big meeting here in Brussels yesterday of European foreign ministers. They agreed um, that there would be this prepared package of sanctions uh, which will be put on the table to be discussed. And I think the level of sanctions will depend on Putin's next move. Possible sanctions, though, would include the blocking of imported gas and oil from Russia. Big questions for Germany about the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline that runs from Russia to Germany. Uh, possibly the freezing of assets of individuals as well as companies with links to Moscow. Uh, and then possibly the blocking of uh, vital key electrical components. All of this is still to be confirmed, still to be discussed, but very much the message coming out of Brussels is a united front. And I think Europe very much realises that Putin's move threatens the entire security of their countries at the moment. OK, thank you. Thanks a lot. Also this morning, there are concerns that the scrapping of free COVID tests at the start of April will adversely affect the most vulnerable. Let's speak, should we, to uh, Maddie, who is at uh, a pharmacy which carries out tests in St Albans in Hertfordshire. Opens shortly, I'm guessing. Good morning, Maddie, that they're going to be pretty busy handing out those tests while they can. Good morning, Kay. Yes, with the uh, um, announcement last night that free testing is ending, there will be presumably a rush. The government is actually acting to stop stockpiling, to stop the stockpiling of tests by limiting the number of um, free tests you can order to once every three days rather than once every 24 hours. But it shows how worried so many people are that they will no longer be able to get free tests, whether they have or don't have symptoms. Um, the government points to the, the huge cost, £2 billion a month, to run our current testing programme and says the NHS now has to foot that bill. It, there won't be new funds for it, which is why it will be limited. Only the very elderly and the most vulnerable will be eligible for free tests. The rest of us will have to pay, just like we do if we're getting a test to go overseas and the government thinks it will be a private market like that about 20 pounds for seven tests but it has been widely criticized by both patient groups who say that the very vulnerable the immunosuppressed have been abandoned by this policy but also doctors who have asked why if the government is is keen to monitor the spread they are getting rid of vaccine uh, getting rid of free tests so we will hope to hear some more answers from the pharmacy later about what role they think they can play Lovely. Thank you, Maddie. Thank you. Two severe weather warnings have been issued along the River Severn in Worcestershire and Shropshire as the Environment Agency warns that residents should prepare for significant flooding following heavy rainfall from Storm Franklin. Latest on that with uh, Emma. She was uh, in Leicester for us yesterday talking about something completely different. She's in Budley in Worcestershire today, totally versatile. What's it looking like where you are this morning? Good morning. Yeah. Hello, good morning. Yes, it's already looking pretty bad here, I have to say. I'm just going to step out of the way and you can have a look um, at the River Severn and just how fast it's moving. Now, the very latest on when the water level is expected to reach its peak uh, says half past 11 tomorrow morning, actually. And on the other side of the river are vertical uh, barriers. On this side are the temporary um, blue barriers. They're at a kind of a diagonal and actually uh, they clearly haven't quite done their trick because uh, there is water all the way across the road here, all the way up to people's properties. If you have a look at this direction, you can see just how much this road is already flooded here. So a severe flood warning means that people are urged to act now. Um, there is a risk to life, a danger to life, and that is the case here in Budley, but also 
about 20 miles further north along the River Severn uh, in Ironbridge, where they, they're expecting flooding there too. So this is a very, very worrying time. And just to say, I've just spoken to a neighbour who was hanging out of the window of their flat, and they said this is the third year running that this has happened. It's something they are having to get used to. Lovely. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot. I want to show you this. If you're a numbers nerd, cherish today because it's um, a mathematical rarity, and I'll tell you why. It's the 22nd of the 2nd, 2022. That's known as a palindrome, which is something that reads the same way forwards as it does backwards. But not just that. Jerry, my camera operator, is smiling at this. I've got more for you. It's also an ambigram. And it's a mirror day, which means it reads the same upside down as it does the other way around. How clever is that? Amy, the director's just saying we should have made it flip around. Well, that's your job for the next hour, isn't it? It won't appear again in our live chat. So it's now or never, Amy. Time for a quick look at the weather. Look forward to brighter skies. The weather. Sponsored by Qatar Airways. That's blown your minds this morning, hasn't it? Now it's going to stay unsettled with rain and strong winds pushing through today, leaving sunshine and showers. Fairly mild now with a stiff wind bringing heavy rain and showers. But the southeast is dry for now. The weather. Sponsored by Qatar Airways. <laughs> uh, let's start with this, should we? Uh, in the Times this morning, city hedgehogs are faring better than their country cousins as numbers are no longer on the decline in urban areas. The success is attributed to people creating hedgehog highways by connecting... That's a great image, isn't it? Uh, connecting gardens so they can travel to find food and a mate. So there you go. There you go. He's pausing for a little drink. Lovely. Uh, Adele and her boyfriend getting cosy courtside at an NBA All-Star basketball game in Ohio on Sunday. She looks happy, doesn't she? According to the Express, the rumour is they're planning to tie the knot, but the ring that sparked the murmurings earlier this month was nowhere to be seen, as the singer keeps people guessing. Looks very happy indeed. Ditch the coat, though, love. Not sure about the coat. And in the Telegraph, diver Alice Edgar had a close encounter with a whale shark in the Maldives. <laughs> Look at him. Her husband took the photo. Thankfully, the whale shark was just out grabbing a spot of breakfast and she wasn't it, which is reassuring. Well, there's been a mixed response to the decision to lift England's remaining COVID restrictions this week and end free testing from April. Joining us now is Professor Paul Moss from the Institute of Immunology and Immunotherapy at the University of Birmingham. Thank you very much indeed for joining us um, on the programme this morning. Um, I don't know if you managed to hear what the Health Secretary was saying to us a little bit earlier on, Professor. Um, he thinks it's the right time. Do you? Well, I think, uh, Kay, you have to look at some of the facts that on this that this was based on. I think first is the scientific basis. I'd pick out two things. One is the epidemiology. We're seeing cases, although high, falling. And what's encouraging, of course, is the hospitalisation and deaths are, are markedly down now. I think there were 15 uh, COVID-associated deaths yesterday. So that's encouraging. And then if you associate that with the immunity that we have in the population now through vaccination and, of course, natural immunity, those are encouraging features. And I think we probably do have to consider, secondly, the cost, as, as your correspondent mentioned. Testing at the current level costs around £15 billion a year. I think that's about £40 million a day. We know that's not sustainable. And so the question is how and when that ends. So that's the basis for it. And um, I think some of the things we saw yesterday were quite reasonable. And, and I like the quite targeted approach going forward. Um, and as far as the free tests are concerned, they will be available for some people um, for some time uh, and there will be some inoculations for some people and could be other people in September. But all of this um, assumes that we won't have another killer version of the virus. Absolutely right. And I think... 
One thing I think we can be reassured about is that um, we do have things in place to um, look after as best we can some of the most vulnerable people and also plan for the future. So yes, you mentioned vaccines. So we're going to get a fourth vaccine for people over 75. It's it's a little bit arbitrary, but I, you know I think that's probably as good as you can say at the moment. And the immune suppressed will get their fifth vaccine probably in the spring. Um, the testing will carry on, as you say, for the most vulnerable. They've not been defined yet, but you can imagine that will be the most immune suppressed and the very elderly, perhaps over 80. So I, I think we do need to see free testing there. And there will be some surveillance, of course, carrying on. Uh, as Patrick Vallon said yesterday, it's likely that we'll get new viral variants. Uh, they may not be uh, quite as relatively mild as Omicron, so we have to keep that in place. Do we need annual vaccinations, do you think, for, for the whole population? It seems that that's a default thing that we're coming to, doesn't it? We, we have our influenza vaccine once a year, and so people are assuming that we will have a COVID vaccine once a year. I don't honestly think, um, Kay, that that evidence is there, and we need to monitor that. There's two ways we can do that. One is by assessing the number of infections that people are getting after vaccination and seeing if there's breakthrough. And secondly, doing studies on how our immune system is holding up after vaccination. It looks like that will be the default, but of course the evidence isn't quite there for an annual vaccination yet. OK, it's good to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you. Let's bring in Andy Jones, should we? He's the owner of Jones & Sons Restaurant in East London. Hello, Chi. Thanks for joining us on the programme this morning. How have you been impacted? How's the business been impacted by um, COVID? Uh, well, over the past few years, as you know, it's been uh, relatively devastating, but we'll bring it kind of into the more recent times. The couple of weeks before Christmas, where we suffered all the cancellations, it was widespread in the media, how many hospitality places, restaurants, pubs, bars had a wave of cancellations the kind of two weeks before Christmas, which are really critical weeks in this industry. Since then, it feels like customers have had enough. It feels like customers made a decision to come back after kind of that wave of Omicron spread through London. I think a lot of people got the virus and then, you know, decided that it was a cold, a bit like a flu. They got over it in a couple of days and was like, OK, let's just get back to normal life. A lot of the restrictions in the restaurant industry just didn't make sense to me anyway. Wearing a mask when you walk in, then taking it off when you sit down. It, it, it just felt that it was a bit all over the place and people have just said, right, common sense needs to prevail. Let's move forward. Let's get back into hospitality. Let's get going out again and start socialising. Um, and as far as your customers are concerned, what are you going to... Are you still going to ask them for a COVID pass? Are you going to ask them to wear masks? What have you decided to do? Absolutely not. I've never asked for COVID pass, passes. I've never asked them to wear masks. I've always said it's pro-choice. If you want to wear a mask in this establishment, you're absolutely welcome to. If you don't want to, you don't have to. I feel like we're getting to a situation now where we're being told we need to be happy to have our freedoms back. Now, we live in a democracy. I think people should have been able to make their choices a little while ago when we came out of the really bad phase that was, what, six, eight months ago. This has been a disaster for business. It's been a disaster financially for the government. I think the reputation of the government has taken a huge hit as well. And the quicker we can get back to normal, the quicker we can live with this, like they said yesterday, I think it's a good thing for everybody. Good to talk to you. Um, good luck going forward. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. Joining us now is Lorna Fillingham, who is a full-time carer for her 11-year-old um, daughter. It's good to talk to you on the programme this morning. Um, Emily May, of course, your little girl. Um, how are you feeling about the restrictions being lifted? I'm absolutely astounded by the timing of this because uh, disabled, clinically extremely vulnerable children aged 5 to 11 were only offered a vaccine about 5 to 11 days ago and they were offered that vaccine because they were considered at more serious risk of um, serious effects of COVID. Now, trying to get an appointment for even a first vaccine caused me no end of problem and my child will not be fully vaccinated until eight weeks later. So I, I understand at some point there needs to become freedom, but these children, my daughter um, qualifies because she has profound and multiple learning disabilities, but there's other children on that list who have um, some children with asthma, some children with diabetes, and these children are soon going to be sat in a classroom where they could be sat absolutely next to somebody who is, has um, full-blown COVID. Um, uh, or who doesn't even know they've got COVID, 
because they're in, unable to get a test. So I, I absolutely, I do understand that at some point freedom needs to come. I, I cannot understand the reasoning behind why they would put these vulnerable children at risk at this time. Um, we are being told that it's where we are now, we should um, compare um, COVID to the flu. Do you think that's a reasonable comparison? Um, no, I don't believe it is. There are people there with long COVID and there are um, still um, very young children being hospitalised um, with, with COVID. So this has not gone away. And at the minute, we are being thrown to the wolves because we people are going to have the testing taken away, the capabilities for testing taken away. There's still an awful lot of children out there who um, are in school who will soon be next to a child with COVID who are still vulnerable and not fully vaccinated. It's good to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. I hope, how, how is the little one? Is she OK? She's absolutely fine. She's asleep at the minute. <laughs> oh, good for her. Good for her. Me too. <laughs> it's good to talk to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. You know, it's really difficult, isn't it, for all sorts of people, um, given that the government is ruling, uh, changing the rules from uh, Thursday and uh, no free COVID tests at lateral flows from the 1st of April is what we believe. Uh, let's uh, lift your mood, should we? Look at this, an iconic stone monument from Easter Island began its journey back home yesterday following a campaign to get it returned after being housed in a museum in Santiago for 150 years. The huge Maui statue, which weighs an enormous 715 kilos, a bit like me after Christmas, is being transported to the Chilean city of Valparaiso, from where it will uh, set sail on a journey of about five days to reach the remote Easter Island, known locally as Rapa Nui. The initiative is part of a repatriation programme seeking to return ancestral artefacts. And it's on its way home after 150 years. They look very pleased about it, don't they? Well, again, returning to the crisis in Ukraine, just seeing by the Reuters news agency within the last three moments, they've been speaking to an EU official, saying it's not clear yet if there will be a meeting of EU leaders to respond to uh, the move by Russia, which the British government has seen as an invasion of Ukraine. If there is one, they say, it would be held in person. So we'll keep an eye on what's going to happen as far as that's concerned. We certainly know that the Prime Minister is holding a COBRA meeting as we speak. We did see the Foreign Secretary entering uh, Downing Street earlier today. They convened that meeting at half past six this morning. We are expecting to hear from the Prime Minister once that has concluded. So, of course, we'll bring that to you just as soon as we can. Meantime, let's bring in Tobias Elwood, Conservative MP and former Defence Minister and also um, Chair of the Defence Select Committee. Hello to you, Mr Elwood. I know you've been to Ukraine uh, very recently. They were concerned about what was going to happen next. I had um, the Health Secretary on the programme a short time ago. He was saying that, as far as the British government is concerned, this the invasion has now begun. Is that how you see it? Yes, absolutely right. The Health Secretary uh, is correct. The prospect of war in Europe has moved a little closer as Putin gives the green light for that massive military buildup that we've been speaking about for some time to enter the Donbass region. And uh, he's clearly, this approach uh, breaches the Minsk agreements, specifically the Normandy format. This was the vehicle that would be used to facilitate any change for this region. That's now simply been ignored. And quite rightly, this has been, been met by huge international uh, condemnation, not least from the British, uh, with much discussions about fresh sanctions. My question is, my concern is, will any sanctions actually alter Putin's uh, thinkings or his uh, plans to invade further uh, into Ukraine? And for that, you've got to ask, actually ask the question, what is Putin's uh, strategy? What's his long-term objective? Uh, he can't reform his country because his economy is so poor, so he must rule by fear. And he requires an adversary. So he distracts and blames the woes at home. He blames uh, NATO for that. But he's also seeking a legacy. Uh, his country is not rich. Oil and gas is his thing. But the West is not a guaranteed market. And I think there's a wider picture emerging here of Russia, Putin, wanting to turn his nation towards the East. That's the new geopolitical alliance that we have to uh, recognize. If that is the case, then it does beg the questions as to when he, any sanctions that we impose might actually play into his plan. 
How important is Britain into what happens next? I was looking at, at a quote uh, from the uh, White House press secretary overnight uh, talking about the French president and the German chancellor and the US president all um, speaking as one. No mention of the UK. Oh, it's important that the UK is included. We were one of the first nations to offer our support, providing military training uh, and uh, equipment uh, to uh, Ukraine. That was very evident when I went out there as well. Historically, we've been, been one of the nations that steps forward, perhaps when others hesitate. It is important that the West works uh, in unity because that is exactly what Putin is exploiting. And the two big questions you have now for the West as we move into this escalated new phase of this crisis is firstly, how do we effectively respond uh, to Russia? Now it's breached international law. And secondly, the most important question I hope that will be discussed today is how can we further assist our Ukrainian friends? Uh, like I say, we were one of the first to offer military aid, but what more military assistance can we provide? And is there something that NATO, this most formidable military alliance in the world, uh, can be better utilized to act as a deterrence, such as, for example, the implementation of a no-fly zone. OK. Um, do we also need to consider, I, I did put this also to the Health Secretary, whether we move from defensive weaponry to offensive weaponry in Ukraine? And he said all of this is being considered in COBRA at the moment. I, is that an option? It's not just an option, it's a requirement. We need to recognise that we have a duty to our Ukrainian friends. NATO needs to remind itself what it says on the tin. It is European security. We cannot part what happens in Ukraine outside of the NATO family uh, and just watch what happens. There will be consequences already to European economies because of uh, the invasion. Oil and gas prices, food prices are likely to increase. Where does this go next? That's the big question that needs to be asked if we don't come to the support of Ukraine. As far as um, the, uh, President Putin is concerned, he says uh, his troops are on a peacekeeping uh, mission um, and that um, he, he is there to support these two break breakaway regions of um, Ukraine. And that will be the point that he continues to hammer home. What would our response to that be? Well, we must recognise that we don't uh, agree with those decrees that the Duma has passed, that the Putin spoke about last night, that uh, Lowansk and Donetsk are not part of separatist states, but actually part of Ukraine proper, as indeed is Crimea, which we, I'm afraid, failed to, to act responsibly um, in uh, 2014. This is our moment to make sure that we stand up, stand firmly to Putin, recognise the wider geopolitical movements that are taking place, because there will be huge consequences if we allow this to run. So let's utilise NATO to its full capacity. Let's consider uh, where Putin wants to go long term. Let's make sure we stand firm with our Ukrainian friends. Um, you've just come back, haven't you, from Ukraine. What was it like? What was the mood like? Very, very tense indeed, but a resilience as well, a determination to say that this is their country and they will fight for it. And even if uh, uh, Russia moves its tanks all the way into the capital, to Kiev, uh, they, they will make it so undigestible, if you like, so miserable for any regime uh, to actually try and own it for any length of time. And uh, that's why it's so important that we look at the assistance that we can provide militarily, whether it be drones, be counter uh, cyber capabilities, uh, other weapon systems that can allow them to operate, not just taking on uh, the Russia conventionally, but also to operate an insurgency, which no doubt will follow if a full invasion does, inc uh, does occur. We're glad to see you safe back home, Mr Elwood. Thank you for joining us on the programme. Thank you. Just before we let you go, if you're heading off um, to work, the weather much better than it has been, to be fair. So instead, I just want to show you these fun pictures. Let's take you to Sicily. Uh, Mount Etna has begun erupting, my goodness me. I think I'm right in saying that it's the most active volcano in Europe. Am I right in saying that? I'm sure if I'm not, somebody will tell me very quickly on Twitter. Um, it's the um, latest eruption in the region. There have been no reports of any injuries or serious damage to property, but volcanologists say there has been a rise in activity suggesting that Etna could be headed towards an even more violent outburst. That is what's happening. I'm guessing aircraft that normally fly over that area as a result will be uh, making sure they stay away at least for now. I wonder what ever happened to that volcano uh, that had been erupting for weeks and weeks and weeks in the Canary Islands. Don't know. Don't know, yeah.
I don't know, we'll check it out for you. Uh, coming up, the latest from Ukraine. As Sajid Javid tells this programme, the invasion of Ukraine has already begun. He went on to say that it is a dark day for Europe. As far as the Prime Minister is concerned, he is presently hosting a COBRA meeting in Downing Street. We saw the Foreign Secretary heading into Downing Street um, just before 6.30 this morning. We are hopeful that we'll be able to hear from the Prime Minister in this programme um, to tell us what the next move is as far as Britain is concerned. As far as the government is concerned, they say that given what happened overnight, they see it as an invasion of Ukraine by Russia. What happens next?